Well, hello there. Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today we're very pleased to bring the latest in our 2017 webinar series on the topic of excuses, optimism, and complexity, navigating impact measurement in social innovation. My name is Yana Aranda, and I'm the Director of Programs here at Engineering for Change. I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd like to invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit more about today's webinar. Measuring impact of social innovation projects can be approached in a variety of ways, and there are many competing opinions for what can be measured, what can't, and why. As there is no set of regulations for social innovation practice to date, practitioners must decide how to measure impact ethically to ensure that interventions are helping rather than hurting communities. Today, we are joined by Lauren Weinstein and Chris Vanstone of the Australian Center for Social Innovation, or TATSI, who will help us to understand social innovation measurement techniques that aim to accelerate learning through the design and implementation processes. I'd like to welcome both of you and thank you for joining us today. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to thank the E4C webinar series team. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics or speakers, we invite you to contact the team via the email address visible on the slide, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Today's webinar is part of the E4C professional development offering. Information on upcoming installments in our series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, can be found on the E4C webinars webpage, as well as our YouTube channel. Both of those URLs are listed on this slide and can also be found on our platform. Before we move on to our presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit about E4C and who we are. E4C is a knowledge organization and global community of over 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. These can include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. Membership is free and provides access to current news, data on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and opportunities such as jobs and fellowships. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the E4C site, the better we will be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. We invite you to join E4C's passionate global community and contribute to making people's lives better across the world. Check out our website to learn more and sign up. E4C has two webinars coming up in February. Our next webinar will be in collaboration with the Impact Design Hub on Thursday, February 23rd at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we will be discussing development engineering practice as part of our topic of supporting development actors to practice impact design. A week later, we'll do a technical deep dive on the topic of the role of robotics in global development with Raj Manavan, who is the founder and CEO of the Humanitarian Robotics Technology. Check out the E4C professional development page for more information and for registration details. If you're already an E4C member, we'll be sending you an invitation to both webinars directly. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. I'd love to see where everyone is from today. So in the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen, please type your location. If the chat is not open on your screen, you can access it by clicking the chat icon in the top right corner of the screen. So I'll get us started and actually add my location. Coming to you all from New York. There we go. I see folks are already answering in the Q&A window and I have folks from Indiana and Pennsylvania. Uh, but again, we'd like to encourage everyone to use the chat window to answer this question so that you can get custom to it. See all over the states, Florida, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Indiana. Of course, we have folks from Australia, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, Costa Rica. Um, again, please do use the chat window to answer. Denver, Germany, lovely, lovely. 
For those of you who, again, don't see the chat window, you can click on the icons in the top right-hand corner of your screen with this chat and it'll pop it open. Um, any technical questions and administrative problems or just comments should go into the chat window. And if you need to send a private chat to E4C's admin, you can find us located there in the drop-down. You can also use the chat window to type any remarks. But during the webinar, please use the Q&A window, which is located below the chat type in questions that are directly for their presenters. That way we can keep track of them and not lose your question in the mix of chatter. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour or PDH for the session, please follow the instructions at the top of the E4C professional development page. And again, the URL is listed right here. So um, thank you all for entering your locations. Great to see folks from the UN and Australia and all over the United States and beyond. We're really glad to have you here. Now with this, I'm going to go ahead and move on to introduce our presenters. All right, we have two wonderful presenters today. Chris Vanstone is the Chief Innovation Officer at Taxi. He leads the innovation at this uh, group. He started his career as a product designer, designing biscuits, cameras, and razors, but has spent the last 14 years working with interdisciplinary teams and communities to co-design solutions to social problems. And he is joined by his colleague, Lauren Weinstein, who is a senior social innovator at Taxi and leads co-design and systems change. She is a multidisciplinary designer with a background in sociology and social design. Her experience ranges from ICT development in Nigeria to disability service innovation in Australia. We're very excited to have all these fantastic speakers join us today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to them to share their insights. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Lauren Weinstein, and I have Chris Sandstone here. Hi. We're really excited for the opportunity to present uh, to all of you today a little bit about our journey in monitoring and evaluation. Um, we work in an organization called TAXI, the Australian Center for Social Innovation, uh, and I'll be handing over to Chris to introduce you a little bit to what it is that we do at TAXI. Um, but first, I just want to talk about some of the things that inspired us to explore the value of monitoring and evaluation in our work in social innovation and some of the things that we were running up against as we tried to evaluate the impact of our work at Taxi. Um, so when we started to look at what was the actual impact we were having on lots of different types of social innovation projects, we ran into a, a couple of different assumptions that either we were having or our partners were having or um, some of the other organizations in the space were having. We found that people often thought monitoring and evaluation was a real check on the progress that had happened to date in a project, more of a, uh, a project management approach, or the final decider on whether or not a project should be continued or not, so that, that final assessment, is it, is it good, is it bad, did it work, did it not work? Um, we also heard a lot about how evaluations would be the content you need for a pitch for future funding. So if you've got the if you've got the evaluation saying the project's good, then surely you'll be able to fund the project moving forward. Uh, another thing that we heard a lot about was a gold standard in monitoring and evaluation. So there'd be one type of monitoring and evaluation tool or mechanism or approach, and that would be the one that you would need to use, and you could use it for any kind of project or um, at any stage in a project. And that would be the bar that you would really want to look to, for example, maybe an RCT, something like that. Um, we also had this assumption ourselves a bit at the beginning that monitoring and evaluation is something that would restrict the innovation process, that it would hold us back from iterating and coming up with creative ideas, that it could constrain the types of uh, the types of more disruptive work that we wanted to do in systems change. And lastly, we've heard this across lots of different practitioners. Um, I think lots of people sit in different camps on this, 
But we've heard many people say that it's not possible to measure social impact, that you just can't know how people are exactly affected or how people are benefiting from different types of design or social innovation projects because these projects are so interrelated and context is always changing. Um, this, we've learned a couple things about each of these things. Um, and I think that this is what really set the stage for Taxi to go on a learning journey because we felt it was important to at least find a way to think about how we can understand how to improve our impact or understand what impact we were at to begin with. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about what we've learned across all of these things. But first, I'll hand over to Chris to tell you a little bit more about Taxi and what we do here in Australia. Uh, good morning and afternoon, everybody. Um, so we're coming broadcasting to you today from Adelaide, South Australia, and I want to recognise uh, that we're on the land, the traditional lands of the Ghana people, and pay our acknowledgements to Ghana elders, past and present, and into the future as well. So Taxi is uh, the Australian Centre for Social Innovation, and really we uh, were set up. Um, by the South Australian government, although we've always been independent of government, to find new solutions to long-standing social challenges. Um, we help organisations get insight into problems and opportunities using a human-centred design methodology. Uh, we design and develop new solutions, so often that's services, but also uh, policy solutions. Uh, we help organizations build their innovation capability, um, and we take on much more ambitious projects which are about shifting, um, uh, catalyzing uh, innovation across systems uh, to for the greater good. Um, and of course, you can read more about our work on taxi.org.au. Um, our team, as you would have got a flavor of, is very much uh, multidisciplinary. Um, it's drawn from people with backgrounds in social science and design, but also uh, in frontline practice, uh, in policy development, and in business innovation. Um, and we focus our work in three areas. Uh, on work with families, um, particularly in the child protection space, where we're really trying to uh, catalyze Australia thinking differently about uh, child protection and what it takes to enable all children to thrive. Um, we work with older people. We've got a particular interest there with uh, the baby boomers, and we're currently running a big systems change project that's looking about uh, home and housing for, uh, for um, boomers in particular. Um, and Lauren will talk a little bit more about some of the work that we've been doing in disability, where we're really trying to uh, realise uh, the promise of a big recent policy change here in Australia called the National Disability Insurance Service, uh, which uh, is promising individualised funding for all people with uh, a disability um, and uh, a shift in that market setup. So we're really trying to help organisations develop products and services and build capabilities so we can actually realise uh, those ambitions and the ambitions of people with a disability. We work with NGOs, we work with state government, we work with federal governments, um, we work with for-purpose business um, and increasingly we're working with foundations and philanthropy as well. Um, so it's quite broad our work but it is all situated in uh, these, mostly situated in these three focus areas um, and all situated in Australia and a tiny bit uh, in New Zealand for uh, Robert from New Zealand. Um, so I want to say a little bit about our approach to innovation and uh, I think you guys will be familiar with the sort of, uh, you know, standard sort of four stage design process and this is how we think about it. And just to give a bit of a context, because this is going to be the framework that we use to talk about the different uh, kinds of monitoring and evaluation and learning we've, uh, we're doing and we're exploring at each of these four stages. Um, so we think about it as um, in an innovation process, really you're starting with a great deal of uncertainty. You might not know what the problem is, you might not know who your beneficiaries are or who your customers are or what they value, um, but then over time a good innovation process, whether you're taking a human-centered design process or another one, it's really about inducing, uh, reducing that uncertainty, um, so you've got triangle one going down over time. So we talk about it as four stages, the discover stage, which is really about identifying opportunities. This is typically where 
um, on the ground field work is happening, uh, an ethnographic approach, um, as well as a sort of a review of uh, the systems in which we're working with. The design stage, where typically we're um, prototyping new kinds of solutions, be they policy or services. The trial stage, and this is sort of this latter two stages, more traditionally where the kind of conversation about monitoring and evaluation is the trial stage where you're trying to develop an evidence base for a particular solution and the spread stage where you're trying you've got something that works but you're trying to make it um, you're trying to spread the impact by spreading to other sites or um, scaling up depending on your approach there so really simple model uh, that we use and we're just going and we're going to use it to introduce to you the different kinds of evaluation and monitoring and learning approaches we take across uh, each of these four stages. Um, and so really um, the purpose of uh, innovation for us is really then about testing assumptions. So this is just another um, diagram that we often use. So we often think about our work as in the office, um, in places where we are now, naming and framing the assumptions. What are the things that we think might be true? And then getting out of the office to test those assumptions in the real world. And it's an iterative loop. Um, and I suspect this will be uh, really familiar to lots of you. Laura. So this loop that you see here we, is something that we iterate on throughout the entire duration of a program cycle. So from that discover phase all the way to spread. Uh, and it really informs the way that we learn across projects. Um, and those could be projects to, in any of the sectors that um, Chris talked about before. Um, and we're also working in, in some new sectors as well, including homelessness and youth employment. Um, we've even worked in, in health as well. But fundamentally, our main priority at Taxi is really to see improved outcomes for people. We want to see people living their best lives. And for a long time, we knew that the families we were working with um, were really benefiting for the programs that we were running and the services that we were designing, that they, they really enjoyed them. They, were, um, they would tell us stories about how um, they had increased social networks or they were becoming more confident or some families had um, less relationships that weren't so positive and they were moving on to um, better work opportunities and schooling opportunities. These are the kinds of things that we wanted to be able to articulate, but traditional uh, monitoring and evaluation approaches didn't quite capture all of those stories. Um, a lot of the times we couldn't find the right mechanisms to really celebrate the nuance and the complexity of how these projects were running. And so um, in a way that the families and the communities that we work with and that our partners and that our funders could all appreciate, as well as our own staff to understand what exactly was the whole point of doing this kind of work. And so um, while we recognize that monitoring and evaluation was really important, um, we often found that the evaluations we were using were kind of coming at that later end of the, of the process uh, that Chris was talking about. And some of the recommendations we would hear about projects were really valuable. And we thought, well, this would, this would have been actually quite useful to integrate into the project design much earlier. Um, we know that it works, but maybe there are some things that we could have tweaked or iterated on much sooner. And so today we want to tell you a story about how or why we've kind of abandoned this idea of monitoring and evaluation and moved to the idea of monitoring, evaluation, and learning. Um, we think that this is, um, we think that there's a real opportunity to think about what monitoring and evaluation and learning looks like as a process in parallel with innovation um, and something that can inform our work even at the earliest stages of what we do. Um, we are really starting to address this more in a meaty way just now um, as we're a pretty young organization. So we're on a learning journey too to understand what exactly does it mean to do really rigorous monitoring, evaluation, and learning in a variety of different projects in a variety of different contexts. Um, so we're not necessarily experts, but we want to share with you a lot of the things that we've found to be really useful. Um, and also the types of things that surprised us along the way uh, because we believe that measuring impact um, is really a way that we can 
improve the types of outcomes that we deliver for people and hold ourselves accountable to doing the better work for the people that we serve and the people that we partner with. So back to this diagram, because this is going to be a little bit of the structure or the framework um, for how we describe some of the different things that we've tried in monitoring and evaluation. Um, so we basically, we've done a lot of work in taxi across all of these four stages, but a lot of times, of course, our projects start in the discover phase, or sometimes even funders ask us to just do the discover work or just discover to design. Um, and that's not typically the place where people are asking you to do monitoring and evaluation. Um, and we're starting to starting to feel like it would be a bit too risky to wait to evaluate or understand our impact or understand just how good the project was or if we had really done the things we set out to do um, three years after we started the project or once the project had already come to a trial phase. So we've been working with an organization called Clear Horizon um, in Melbourne, which is a really a human-centered focused monitoring and evaluation organization who's been helping us think about what are flexible ways to do this, what are ways to really understand um, how do we hold ourselves accountable to the things that we set out to do in the discover phase in a way that keeps the door open for us to explore organically what all the opportunities are. Share with you an example from one project that we're working on in right now in the discover phase. So this is a little bit about what Chris was referencing before. In Australia, there's been quite a big shift um, towards the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which is going to be giving individuals and families choice in how they spend um, their disability pensions, on what services they want, um, from which agencies they want. And this is really putting the control back into the hands of the people who are going to be benefiting from services. And so we're supporting one of a, one larger nonprofit organization in Australia to think about how they can develop um, three new innovative services that uh, really speak to the needs and the wants and the values of the people who would be benefiting from them. So people in Australia with disability across different age ranges and across different um, types of disability and complexities of disability. And what we're exploring in this piece of work is really what would radically different disability services look like if we actually designed them with, for, and by people with disability. And what I mean by that is that we've brought on people with disability to be part of our research team and also the co-design team. So we're researching what people with disability and their families would really want in services and support work in in supports that help them reach their goals and ambitions, and we're doing all of that. Um, all of that is being informed by people with lived experience of either caring for someone with disability or a person with disability. And um, throughout this work, we realize that it's incredibly important to understand what the questions are that we're setting out to answer um, even before we get into that design phase. So in a lot of projects that I've been in before, we have a set of questions and um, we go out, we do a bunch of qualitative research and it's quite hard to know how you're tracking on the types of questions you're setting out to understand. Um, what we think, we think Mel has a really important role in this space, in the discovery phase before you're implementing anything, just to really help you structure and track um, your research progress and rigorously know which assumptions you're naming, which assumptions you're testing, uh, to know how just how much you've learned, uh, how true those learnings are and what the gaps still are. Um, so we have come up with different sets of questions that we think are really important to answer in terms of monitoring, evaluation, and learning in these different phases. So in this phase, what we're really trying to understand is do we even design the right project and do we have the right approach? And so we would have hoped to have named that in the beginning of the project, but we're constantly checking that because we know context can change and, as, um, and our learnings are going to change over time. And so we may have had some assumptions about what the right approach would have been at the front end of the project, but as we get into it, we wanna make sure that that's still right. Um, we want to make sure that we're starting to understand what questions we need to answer and really be able to name what the barriers are and what 
new opportunities are. And we want to be able to hold ourselves accountable to the intent for this project. So for us, it's really important that we're going to be able to do research with and design new services with people with disability. And so we need to make sure that we're really holding ourselves accountable to including the people that we say we want to include. Um, and we also need to make sure that we are checking back in with the respondents that we've, we've taken with us on this journey. So we want to make sure that ethically, um, the families that we've engaged with are still feeling okay about the stories they shared with us. We also want to make sure that the way that we have understood the things that they've told us and the ideas that we've come up with are still articulating their stories with integrity. So we go back to the people that we spoke to in the beginning and check in with them about how do they feel about these ideas or these are things that you were explaining to us did we get it right. Um, I'll show you a quick example of what some of these frameworks would look like. So now this is just quite, kind of a boring table, but actually what it helps us do is check back in every day after research to understand if we're making progress. And so basically we have three lines of inquiry and we're trying to understand what users want in that first row. Um, and we're also trying to understand if any of these services are actually financially viable, will they be sustainable over the long term? And uh, we need to, every day when we go out and do research and have interviews and use generative research tools, we want to make sure that um, we're actually answering the questions we set out to answer, um, that if we have new questions, we're adding them in here, um, and that we're, if we're not answering certain questions, what is it about our approach to research that's creating that gap in our knowledge? So that's a, one small way that we're starting to kind of structure and think about just how much we're learning in a discover phase. Um, when we move more into a design phase, I want to share an example of a project that I've been working on in the child protection space. So this project is called Rethinking Restoration, and it's funded by the Sydney Meyer Fund. Um, it's a three-year project, and we're partnered with uh, a government family and community services agency in New South Wales, um, and we're also partnered with an um, academic research team and a monitoring and evaluation team. And so in this project, what we're really trying to understand is how we could potentially redesign the child protection system so that it helps more children live at home with their families and thrive over the long term. And um, what we've found in the space is, of course, that is quite a complex space. There are entrenched um, practices within the, um, the child protection system. Um, there's lots of socio-economic um, and cultural factors that come into play here. Uh, it's not a real simple answer. We can't just break off one part of the system and say we're going to fix that piece and then expect the rest of the, the pieces to fall into place. Um, it's also, we have real people with real lives at stake and there are really big risks associated with trying to test new things with families and their children. So monitoring and evaluation is incredibly important to us at this, at, in this project and we want to make sure that we are monitoring and evaluating at before we even begin to pilot. So, and we didn't understand exactly what that might look like, which is why we asked that organization Clear Horizon to support us with that, because we knew that we, we wanted to be able to tell from the earliest stages of a design as we were prototyping what it was that we were learning and what those early indicators were that we had the right idea for what we should be doing and we have the right um, hunch around our um, theory for how we're going to create behavior change for people and that we're protecting the people that we're working with at the same time. So some of the things that we're looking at understanding during this kind of phase is what are our assumptions about how this design will actually work and behave and that might be within the service or the system um, or the program itself or amongst individuals. We really want to test the logic of our design. So if we say um, people are going to use these three services and it's going to help them build capacity in these ways and then ultimately they're going to end up living happier, healthier, thriving lives. We want to make sure that all of that is, is not just an assumption on our part that it's actually going to work. So that needs to be backed in evidence and we also need to try things in the real world. Um, 
And then we also want to make sure that we are collecting data that indicates early outcomes. So for this kind of project, we're not going to be able to see um, within a really short amount of time lots of children returning home and living safely with their parents once they've been separated. But what we can see are really small indicators that things are starting to get better um, because we want to and we want to know at the earliest stages that things are starting to improve. Um, don't want to wait until five years later um, and then say oh, well, that didn't work, we're sorry. Um, we want to make sure that uh, as we're testing and iterating that we're learning from um, each of the activities that we do um, and each of the elements of the prototype. So for this project, um, this is just a, a small picture of a theory of change that we were trying to map out for one of the pilots or prototypes that we were working on. and so. What you'll see, if you can see the quite tiny writing, is that all the way at the top, um, we've got some really high level, broad goals and outcomes that we think this type of thinking can contribute to. And then below that masking tape line is actually the end of prototype outcomes. So these are the types of things that we know we can be held accountable for within this project. And then do you see those little yellow dots? Those are things that we've named as um, things that we want to be able to measure. And we've come up with strategies to, to identify exactly what is the data we would need to collect to measure those different things. So like are children happy and thriving and indicating um, attachment with their families? And are they, in, are they showing that they're having lots of healthy, productive play? Um, are families building some of their social capital, working towards um, higher education or having behavior change in terms of what they think good parenting is, um, surrounding themselves with positive role models, all things like that. And so for each of those yellow dots, actually there would be a different way that we would collect that data. Um, and some of it might be from the people who are participating in the project themselves, some of it might be from us, some of it might be from our partners, and um, some of it might be through just us hearing anecdotes, and some of it might be more quantitative data, but that's all dependent on what is the question that we're trying to answer. And so what we'll do is collect data all throughout the prototype um, and continually say, well, this seems like it's working, this seems like it's not, what do we need to check in on, and what do we need to iterate and change for the next, um, the next piece of this work. So I'll hand over to Chris to talk a little bit about what things look like in the next stage of um, a design project. But first, I'll probably introduce it, um, an, uh, a project that Taxi's been working on for quite a long time um, that's more in the latter stages of that design um, and innovation program cycle. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so I think what's really interesting about what Lauren's just been talking about is we're using, uh, we find ourselves now using a MEL approach in the early stages of the process that's really where the primary stakeholders of that process are the teams that, that, that are doing, are the taxi teams that are doing uh, the work. And so it's not something that we're doing to sort of satisfy funders, it's fun, something that we're going to do that we're doing to kind of improve uh, how we do our work uh, at the very earliest uh, stages. Um, but I'm going to talk about the latter stages where, yeah, of course, then you start to think of some other different stakeholders that are the key audiences for uh, NEL work. Well, so what I'm going to, so, so really I think what I'm going to share sort of adds on top of what uh, Lauren's just been talking about in that you still want to know, are we doing the right kinds of projects? Um, and you still want to know, you know, is the design of this thing um, still right? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about Family by Family, and you can read more about this online at familybyfamily.org.au. Um, and this was really one of the earliest projects of Taxi about six years ago. Um, and it's been designed uh, through uh, human-centered design methodology, which really started with the question, how can we enable more families to thrive and fewer to require crisis services? So it's really working in that ch child protection space, which is a very hot topic well, in many places, but very hot here in Australia. Um, and essentially, um, through that process, we developed, uh, and in response to that question, we developed up a model uh, where we find families that have been through tough times and uh, train them up to support families currently in tough times. So it's very much a peer-to-peer -peer support model. And um, uh, the professionals are in the background supporting the families uh, to make 
change. Um, and so in this project, we actually didn't do any of the MEL work that uh, Lauren's just been talking about in the uh, discovery stage or the uh, design stage, certainly not with the sort of rigor that uh, Lauren's been sharing. But we did in, uh, in the trial stage, and it's probably been in that trial stage for the last uh, three years or so, and we're just on the verge of um, that, uh, that, next, uh, that next stage. So really what's... Um, because we've taken, um, whilst we didn't do it with such rigor, but because we've taken that approach of really thinking about how can we build in ways of uh, monitoring into the uh, into the program itself. So there's this particular nice tool which originally started on paper, but is now um, an app that runs on an iPad that enables families to um, self-identify the changes that they want to make in their lives. Um, and then track progress against those changes. So it's something that we uh, developed in that design stage, primarily for families, uh, so families could see change in their own lives. Um, but now uh, we're using it to collect data on the, um, the, uh, and aggregate that data. So we've got the data on the impact of the program. Um, but uh, that, so that's one thing that, uh, that, that we're collecting in this stage. Um, but of course, then we also, at this stage, are trying to develop up an evidence base uh, for the potential funders of this, uh, ongoing funders and investors of this work. Um, so we found ourselves uh, looking at uh, some different kinds of things. So people are really interested in things like unit cost. They're really interested in does this actually uh, increase usage of services where people want to see them increased and decrease usage of services where they want to see them decreased. Um, how does this compare with like programs? Um, and what's the uh, cost benefit of uh, this particular approach? So if you do go to, if you want to dig into the details, there's um, a lot of, all, all those are uh, online at familybyfamily.org.au. Um, and really, um, some of the stuff that we did to get that sort of data in here was um, um, some, uh, some comparison between a like site where, which didn't have this intervention to understand were we actually making a difference in service usage. It turned out that yes, we were, um, but that wasn't necessarily sustained as long as we'd like to see it. Um, we we're able to uh, extrapolate from that reduced service usage, uh, in this particular case, to reduce notifications of child protection issues um, to a cost saving. Um, and quite a conservative cost saving. That was so we know for family by family, or there's quite a conservative estimate. Um, so we know for every dollar you invest in family by family, um, eleven dollars is saved for government through reduced usage of uh, crisis uh, services, child protection services. Um, and we know that it compares favourably on a unit cost with other programs. Um, but I think there's a really uh, so that's sort of you know not perhaps surprising stuff. And I think sort of where we when we talk about measurement and evaluation, we often start here. Um, but I think what's been a, an important caveat to all of that is, um, I, think, I think particularly in um, uh, government systems, uh, just because you've got great data doesn't mean that people want to invest. Um, and so we've been doing a lot of work more recently to really try and understand um, what are all the other things that we need to uh, package up for the value proposition for investing in family by family? Because uh, political decision making processes are not, well, certainly in Australia, um, are not rational processes. Uh, they can be quite emotional. They, it's about linking together all sorts of different um, political uh, agendas. Timing is really important. Um, so there's a whole bunch of that I guess the point I wanted to make is great to have evaluation, but that's not necessarily going to be sufficient to, um, to create a case for invest in ongoing investment in some cases. And now we're just on the edge of that um, spread stage with family by family. So very recently, we've just created the family by family global hub, um, which sounds very exciting, but it's just two people. And we're supporting uh, service delivery in two sites in Australia, um, but also uh, in conversation with Canada and with New Zealand to um, support uh, the growth of the program um, and to other states in Australia as well. And so really, I guess the kind of the crux of the um, conversation here when it comes to measurement and evaluation has been how can we actually build, uh, and this is a bit of background, um, and so 
Taxi is currently uh, delivering all of these um, all of these programs, but our ambition is to transfer that to not-for-profit service providers. We see ourselves as very much as an incubator of new service models. Um, we think we've kind of done that. Um, and so now we're looking at different kinds of uh, structures to get investment into this, to get shared ownership of this, and to get the model itself uh, spreading nationally and internationally. Um, but we've been thinking really hard, and I it's not a question that we've answered yet, but how do we set up a really good approach to monitoring and evaluation and learning that really enables local sites to do a number of things? Um, so to see, um, are they delivering the program as designed? Um, is that creating the intended uh, impact? And if not, is that, uh, does that mean the program, the design of the program itself needs to change? Um, is the global hub providing an appropriate uh, kind of support, as well as aggregating uh, the change across all of those uh, different sites? Um, and that gets quite complex in terms of the systems that you need to be able to do that uh, efficiently and effectively. So I think I'm going to hand back on to Laura's going to join me for this last bit. Um, so across all of the the work that I've done before Taxi and um, that I've gotten to do at Taxi, I think what really rings true is that it it doesn't matter how how good your intentions are or how much you want to make an impact for people, um, how much good you think you're doing. At the end of the day, really need to know what kind of change we're making, um, and we need to know that with quite a bit of rigor, and we need to understand um, what that impact is so we can continue to make more of that good kind of impact and elevate the work that we do over time. And what we've come to see in this type of work is really that the monitoring and evaluation is, and learning um, is really about getting clear about what it is that you want to achieve and acknowledging what you know and what you might not know, being able to collect the right data to, to, to demonstrate that, but then most importantly, reflecting and learning on that data over time, over the course of the entire program cycle. And what's really stood out to us is that some of those assumptions that we had at the very beginning um, in going through this project and kind of coming up with this trialing this more monitoring, evaluation, and learning approach is that we have a bit of a different take on some of those assumptions now. So I think what we've come to see is that monitoring, evaluation, and learning has a role at every stage of the process. It doesn't need to just be in the trial and spread stage. There's lots that can be done in discovery and design. Um, evaluations are really just one piece of the funder pitch. There's lots of things that funders are going to need to know. Um, there's lots of things that they're um, going to be curious about. And we shouldn't do monitoring, evaluation, um, and learning just for the funders. Um, we need to do it for ourselves and for, ben for our beneficiaries and the communities that we work with as well. Um, that monitoring, evaluation, and learning works best when you draw from a portfolio of different approaches and that you, when you choose the methods that match purpose, match the purpose. So like there'll be a time and a place for an RCT for most significant change, for, um, for a baseline assessment, for being able to gather those anecdotes about um, stories and what people are experiencing in terms of change over time. Um, but that all depends on the question that you're trying to answer and the type of work that you're trying to do. So tailoring it to what the what's most appropriate, what's going to help you learn the most um, about the impact of the project. Uh, we think that monitoring evaluation, rather than restricting our work, actually helps us accelerate the rigor of our learning because it helps us name what exactly is working and not working at really early stages and then gives us some data to be able to pivot and iterate on. And then above all, um, I think social impacts are definitely measurable. Um, it might be an excuse to say they're not. Um, I'm optimistic that they are, just have to find kind of the right ways and approaches to be able to identify what it is that you want to measure and how. So I think we'll just, uh, I think that's our time. So we'll uh, just, uh, leave it there and I think uh, open up for questions. So thank you so much to both of you for a, a really fruitful and, and deep discussion.
Um, so one question has already uh, come in. I'm going to kick it off with that one. Um, this, the question is regarding root cause analysis, and specifically the, the listener says that they didn't hear about root cause analysis in the process. Uh, does that enter the approach? And if so, can you speak to where? Yeah, that's not um, that's not an approach that we uh, have used in our work. Um, it's not something that we felt that we needed to use. I think in the early stages, yeah, we're trying to understand what contributes to um, what contributes to particular social uh, challenges as well as what can contribute to better outcomes. Um, but as, but as a method, it's not not one that uh, we have used. Yeah, I think what we try to do a lot of is um, in that discovery phase is understand what exactly is the the issue at hand and what are the what's the complexity of other factors that are contributing to that at um, a variety of different levels. So what's happening in a at the community level, um, what's happening amongst services and institutions, what's happening um, and more strategic policy level that um, might be contributing to that. Uh, what can we learn from existing evidence to say um, mm -hmm. these are some of the things that we should be exploring? Uh, I think, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that the that um, as soon as yeah, I think we would we're really open to using lots of different methods, and um, this is kind of a learning journey for us as well. And so, when the time mm -hmm. and the place. Uh, is appropriate, I'm sure we'll be exploring something like root cause analysis as well. Got you. So uh, on that notion of, of using a variety of approaches, of approaches in order to uh, really understand the picture and what's really happening, can you, you mentioned the use of anecdotal data as, as part of the mix. Um, can you give us a, a little bit of a sense of, uh, you know, do you, do you have some guidelines or um, some best practice that you've already developed around a balanced mix of approaches uh, at any one point? Is it like 30% anecdotal, 20% uh, quantitative? Uh, can you give us any any insights regarding that? I think that's something that we're um, trying to work out right now as we sort of engage in this media approach to uh, mail across all of our work is, yeah, what is the right mix of uh, methods and approaches at those different stages? Um, and yes, in um, generalizing in the earlier stages, you are, well, it also depends on the kinds of projects, right? Mm -hmm. So you had to generally have more uh, anecdotal data at the start, but then it's also, um, I wonder if that's, um, it's also p p possible to turn anecdotal data into um, something that is more, uh, Statistical or something that can give you a kind of picture across across the board of uh, of, of impact with using things like most significant change um, approach. Yeah, and I think in terms of things like family by family, that was a lot. That all that anecdotal data was how we came to understand that um, it was really working for people. Um, so we would hear stories about how um, you know things were really tough before family by family, but family by family is the one thing that changed you know, this family's life for the better um, and that they don't know where they would be without it. And they can talk about lots of specific things around what their their link up, what their sharing family did to help them get to a better place. Um, but yet when the government would want to see an evaluation, those weren't really the things that they were, um, that were going to be able to make that, to help them make the case that they should fund it for another year. And so while those things were incredibly valuable to us internally to help us understand um, what was working for people or specific things that people didn't like. Um, often we would respond to things that people said, okay, you know, this is, this is not really um, what we want, um, and then iterate based on that. It became more of an, I guess, our way of gauging what needed to change and iterate. Um, but we were, I think we're just now trying to improve our sophistication around saying, okay, these anecdotes are actually really valuable things that, um, government and funders and external stakeholders need to hear as well. Um, we can do the, the types of evaluations that you think are necessary, um, but these but anecdotes are really the way that you can tell the story and provide texture around what that real experience is for the people. Um, Got you. And pulling on that thread a little bit, and I, 
I apologize if anybody out there is not hearing me while I see one comment about my audio maybe being not that great, so we'll check that out. But at this time, I have no other alternatives, so I'm going to continue. Uh, with, with respect to collecting um, anecdotes or stories or insights, considering that we are here on Engineering for Change's platform, and uh, I think many of us are curious to know how, how you approach that. You mentioned do, during your talk that you used iPads with questionnaires and other methods. Can you speak to us a little bit about how you ensure that you collect that information from what I imagine is a spread of families or you know, participants in a way that allows you to also organize it, you know, analyze it, and do whatever else is necessary in order to tell the narrative quickly. Yeah, so I think that how we do that looks different at different stages. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, yeah, certainly in those latter stages, it's, it's thinking about what are the sorts of systems that you can build into um, the solution that can collect that anecdotal evidence um, and um, systematize and aggregate that. And with family by family, hopefully we'll be doing that across multiple sites in multiple countries. Um, so it, practically family by family, the, the tool there is something called the bubble diagram where families fill in a bubble at the center of the page where and now on an iPad where they say what they want to achieve, um, the contributing factors to that, so sort of a mini theory of change really. And then they evaluate their progress on a 10 point thermometer scale um, from uh, at the beginning, middle, sorry, before, during and after uh, a link up. Um, and that gives us data on the kinds of goals that families are looking to change and their mm -hmm. assessment of uh, progress against those goals. Um, in the earlier stages, the anecdotal data collection is um, it's, it, it's a lot less, well, it has structures, but it's different. Yeah, I, th mm -hmm. I think in some of the earlier stages, but we try to, we would try to name some of the indicators that um, at least people are feeling, so say, for example, if it's in a research project, we would want to know that people are feeling um, comfortable and um, at comfortable and engaged in interviewing with us and that's something that they want to do and they feel that that's voluntary. Um, we want to know that some of the stories that we've heard as they've reflected back to them um, are, we're describing them with integrity. They're the types of things that they, they would have felt comfortable com us communicating outwardly. Um, so it, it takes a little bit more of a, like an accuracy and an ethics um, strategy. And, and I guess some of the ways that we've done this, and I'll just reflect on the first project that I talked about, um, is that we would we had um, two quite long interviews with families, and then we mm -hmm. analyzed the data that they shared with us, and then we went back to them with um, summaries of that to get their feedback on that, and just kind of check if those were the kinds of things that they were really communicating to us, um, and then um, would pull out some of the key quotes that we felt um, needed that we felt really described some of the. I guess the pains and the gains or the things that were helping mm -hmm. during them um, and some of the things that would um, indicate that there was an opportunity to do something differently. Um, and so that, um, yeah, in other projects that I've been on that might be categorized quite rigorously in the spreadsheet and we would have um, maybe different categories of, of topics that we wanted to collect um, that anecdotal evidence mm -hmm. around. Um, I think in in the design phase, we will need to name all the indicators that we're looking for um, and be able to collate the, the data that we're collecting from families, um, also from different services and from government agencies, um, and be able to, to analyze that and share that more widely with our and own team. Right. And how do you manage the associated risks, for example, you know, participant exhaustion or and this can be both in regional projects or local uh, projects, but also international where folks feel like uh, they keep getting asked the same questions over and over again by different agencies and it just eventually just uh, kind of refuse to talk about it or kind of are, are over it, so to speak. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, so there's a couple of ways that we do that. Um, one is if it's in a design phase of a pro or in a, sorry, a, a trial or spread phase of the project, we try to make sure that that's built into the experience. So the bubbles that Chris was talking about, that's very much part of um, families' 
experience in participating in that service. So rather than it mm -hmm. feeling extractive to them, that's part of what they do. Yet we also use that data to understand how well the program is operating. So we try to double up um, to make sure that we can embed the questions that we need to ask in part of the experience for people. Um, mm -hmm. in, in interview stages, um, we make sure that families understand exactly what they're committing to before we even get started. So we say, this is actually, this will be three interviews, this is the amount of time, these are the kinds of questions mm -hmm. that we are going to be asking of you. Is that something that you'd like to commit to? Um, at any stage, you can drop out, and we make that really clear and give them the option to do that. One of the things that happens in the child protection space is that families are often asked to tell their story over and over and over again to different service providers. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. that can be not only exhausting but traumatic. And so we try to make sure that um, the way that we ask people to share their stories with us is um, what we would call potentially therapeutic and empowering. So we find different um, kind of, it may be paper-based drawing strategies or um, different kinds of safe ways to communicate a story that really helps people end on a high um, and have a kind of, have a, a real conversational engagement with people. So it's not just um, us extracting information from them. I think another part that plays a role in that is the fact that we often get to move these projects beyond um, research and into design, which means that people have the option to start to turn their ideas into reality, into some sort of design um, opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so they tell us this thing is really bothering me and then we can work on how might we make that better and work on that together. So it doesn't just feel like we've come in, we've asked you some questions and then we're never going to see you again. Um, that mm -hmm. actually if you wanted to be a part of this over the long term, you could. Uh, and we found that that's been something that people are really excited about. Um, uh, I mm -hmm. think we're also in Australia. Um, we're quite lucky in that um, there's not a ton of other organizations that are also asking the same people the same questions. So usually <laughs> we're, this is kind of the one opportunity that some of the families that we're working with get to do this. So we've not experienced so much of that fatigue, um, but we do try to be aware of that um, at the outset, mm -hmm. I think it's really about being clear um, about what people's commitment is. I know that I've experienced that um, in other projects internationally, and mm -hmm. um, I think one of the ways that we try to do that best is to to really embed the data collection in the part in whatever the design is, so we can kind of reduce that fatigue over um, over their engagement with the project. Definitely. I think ma managing expectations early on is, is just uh, really an important part of it, and that speaks to how, how critical it is to plan early and, and really understand what your strategy is going to be around MEL. So uh, we have one question that I, from a, a participant that I want to make sure we address uh, before we close out, and it is, have you considered using relational modeling techniques in your approach? Um, I, I, have, I haven't tried that before, but I've, I'm really interested to look into it. Um, if there's, if, yeah, if there are some suggestions or um, experiences that other people want to share through the chat, we'd be really keen to hear that. Oh, that's lovely. And we definitely encourage our listeners to connect with the speakers. Uh, as you can see, their email addresses are listed on the slide in front of you. Uh, you're also welcome to reach out to the webinars admin if you'd like to make a recommendation um, you know, anonymously or something to that effect. Uh, but it's good to see that there's a, a dialogue happening here, and we welcome that dialogue at all of our webinars. Um, with that, we are approaching time. And I just realized we got to that question slide a little too late. But I would like to thank everybody for attending, participating in today's webinar. For those of you who are seeking your professional development hours for this webinar, please uh, reference the code listed on the slide when applying for your certificate. If we didn't get to your questions or you have questions that arise after this webinar is complete, please feel free to email us at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. And of course, we invite you to become an E4C member to get information about upcoming webinars. 
With that, I'd like to thank Lauren and, and Chris. Thank you so much for joining us today and taking time out of your busy morning <laughs> to, to help us understand a little bit more about what you are doing at Taxi and how Mel can be integrated into the practice of um, all social innovation projects. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be, and we'll catch you on the next D4C webinar. Bye-bye.